This episode is sponsored by Audible. Stick around for an exclusive offer. Subscribe and click the notification bell to never miss a new episode chock full of scary stories. Today, we're going down by the river because very terrifying things sometimes wash up on the riverbed and you don't want to be around when they wake up. Not to mention, sources of water always attract prey and where there's prey, there are monsters. Enjoy these allegedly real sightings of river monsters. And if you want your story to be featured in a future episode, share your story with us at darknessprevails.org slash submit. I'm looking for stories from game wardens and other forest workers. And don't forget, you can catch my newest animated horror story with the link below. Now, on to the show. Strange Creature in Dimming Membrae's Riverbed from Drummer Woman 21. Location, New Mexico. I live in a small town in New Mexico, and nothing really goes on here. I live in a small trailer park that's next to the Membrae's Riverbed, and water doesn't flow unless there's a lot of heavy rain, so it's nice to take walks through. Also, I live outside of town. I was 20 years old. I just got into an argument with my mother, and I decided to cool off by going to take a walk in the riverbed. The sun was starting to set at that point, so it was pretty nice out. I was probably walking for about 45 minutes. I had to stop to catch my breath for a moment. Admittedly, I am out of shape, and walking fast through that deep sand took a bit out of me. I was pretty far from home by that point. Still fuming and being me, I decided to go further. It was getting dark now, and I was tired, and after a few more minutes of walking, I convinced myself I should probably head back, even if I was still mad at my mother. It was like the moment I turned around on my heels, a switch flipped, because when I turned around, I was instantly terrified. An overwhelming feeling like I shouldn't be there right now, like I had wandered into the wrong part of the riverbed, flooded me. Out of all the times I'd been there before, never have I felt this way. I started walking much faster now. Suddenly, I was hit with this horrible stench. On edge but curious, I decided to see if I could find where the smell was coming from. I turned on the flashlight on my phone and I began to scan my surroundings. I tried to follow the smell, which is difficult to do with a human nose, but I managed to find that the smell got stronger just a few feet out of the riverbed next to me. I walked forward toward it and I nearly screamed and fell backward when I saw it. A horse lay on the ground, what was left of it. Something had chewed on it and tore it up. It didn't even look like a horse anymore. I muttered under my breath, what happened here? When suddenly, I heard a sound coming from a bush a few feet away. I was already over the edge at this point, so I jumped at this sound, and when an awful sounding growl followed it up, I was almost in tears. There was an underlying sound in that growl, unlike anything I'd ever heard before. It was like someone screaming combined with an animal's aggressive growl. I pointed my light in the direction of it. What I saw, good God, it was horrific. Its skin was a brownish color, and it had some fur on its back, arms, and legs. It was somewhat skinny, and its hands, which were covered in red fluid, had long and crooked nails. I looked up at its head. There was a long muzzle, dripping with a dark substance. Its eyes, they were like fading embers. When it saw that I was staring at it, it let out this ear-piercing howl. But once again, that underlying human-like scream emerged from just under the howl. I turned and ran through the riverbed, my legs feeling like jelly. Despite this, I kept running because if I stopped, I knew that thing would be the end of me. 
When I looked back, I did see the figure of the thing following me, but it was slow. It seemed to want to watch what I was doing rather than hunting me down. Still, I was in shock, desperate to get home. With my heart beating through my ears, I finally found the spot to exit the riverbed. For the last few minutes, I hadn't heard the thing behind me, so I felt confident in turning around just to check. I screamed, because the creature was only a few feet away, silent in the way it stalked. If you were standing still in the woods, and all the sounds around you went quiet, you still wouldn't have heard this thing coming right up to you. And I swear to God, right before I broke into my run again, I heard something else coming from its maw. <laughs> Either it was laughing, or it made some sort of animal noise that I just didn't understand, but I couldn't help but think that that sounded like a chuckle. After this laugh, it turned back in the direction it had come from, but I didn't care. I didn't care if it was chasing me or not. I still ran full speed back to my house immediately. I basically flew through the door and fell onto the floor. My mom was already asleep. I sat there, now leaning against the locked door behind me, my mind racing after what had just happened. I still live in that area of New Mexico, and after a few months, I felt comfortable to go on walks in the riverbed again. But never do I go that far, nor do I go at night. I don't go out anywhere close to sundown. Still, sometimes at night, I can hear those screeching guttural howls in the distance, and from so far away, it sounds like a person in need of help. But I know, if I open that door, I'll see that thing waiting for me at the riverbed. If you come to Dimming, New Mexico, never walk through the Membres River at night, and never go alone. Dogman, from Wit 617, location Osceola, Michigan. It was 2007. I was 18. I grew up hearing stories about the dog man, never really believing them. I was told a lot of stories as a kid, stories to scare me, really. I played in the woods a lot when I was young. One warm fall day, my boyfriend, myself, and two other friends went out to see my grandmother at our family cabin. When we got there, my two younger cousins were there. They wanted to walk down to the river, so we all went, leaving my grandmother to have some free time without the two younger boys. As we walk up the hill, the boys wanted to race. So when we made it to the start of a certain trail along the river, we all lined up, and I yelled, Ready, set, go! We all made a mad dash to the end of the trail. Suddenly, a massive buck came from seemingly nowhere, a couple of us nearly running into him. My family is very into hunting. I was no stranger to deer like this, which was why I thought it was so weird that this buck didn't move or panic when it heard us coming, because by no means were we being quiet. As I looked at the deer, I could see it breathing extremely heavily, and its eyes gave off a sense of panic. I looked beyond it to see where it had come from. There was a noise behind it. It turned its head in that direction, and I saw what it was looking at, the thing it had apparently been running from. It looked like a huge black dog, except dogs don't stand on two legs like that. Not with that amount of balance and ease. The all-black creature was staring at the deer, mouth salivating and panting heavily, as if it had just came to a stop after running full speed. We had apparently interrupted something. I looked toward my boyfriend, and he was staring at the creature as well. But the little ones were watching the deer, 
unaware of the horror that was stalking it. When I turn back to the all-black dog-like creature, I see it taking off back down the hill. I run over to my boyfriend, our eyes wide as we looked at each other, without a word agreeing that yes, we really did just see that. As the other boys didn't see it, we didn't say anything about it. Rather, we went to the river and walked back to the cabin. All the while, they complained that we had called it quits too early. When we left my grandma's that day, my boyfriend didn't really talk about it, even after we were alone. Later that night, some friends came over, and all the boys from before came too, wanting to play Guitar Hero. Now, the place my boyfriend and I live is a farmhouse, quite an old one, and some of the windows in it are floor-to-ceiling windows. They're about seven feet tall. As we watched the boys playing Guitar Hero and having a great time, I saw something beyond them through the window that at first I thought was our dog, but that wasn't our dog. It looked like a dog. It had its mouth open, and it was far too tall to be a normal canine. I freaked out and began to cover the windows, lying about why I was doing so. I wondered, had that thing found us, followed us for some reason? Was it mad that we had interrupted its hunt, or was I just seeing things after being so shaken up? That was a very creepy day. Never Again from Dracula's Nightmare Location, Kentucky I live on a large piece of land by the Green River in Kentucky. There's 243 acres on the land, to be exact. But despite it being so large, we only have so much to hunt, fish, and ride four-wheelers on. There weren't many roads or fields, so we mostly used the place for hunting, as the only pond for fishing was far too small for bass. We ended up using it for bluegill and sunfish. This took place when I was 15 to 17 years old. It was deer season that year, and since I had school, we only went on weekends to hunt. This was the third weekend of deer season, and I had only even seen a doe. I was in a tree stand that day, on the edge of the first field you get to on the logging road. It was almost night, and you could hear the river nearby. I hadn't seen anything save for a few turkeys passing through to get some water out of a small pond, the one I was talking about earlier. Fed up and irritated, I was leaving at that point. I was getting bored, doubting that I'd see anything. When I heard a ruckus from nearby, I stopped and listened. Down at the edge of the nearby field, I could hear a pack of coyotes howling like crazy. They were way too close to the house and could pose a problem to us, so I grabbed my rifle and I ran down, aiming in at the group. But then I saw that there was only one coyote. It was huge, oddly tall, easily the biggest one I'd ever seen. I remember rearing my head back and squinting, wondering how in the world did this single coyote make all that noise it had sounded like a whole group down here. I continued to aim, and I slowly squeezed the trigger. I'll be serious when I say this. I will never feel another GTFO moment like this. That coyote looked directly at me, and I soon realized that it was standing up on two legs, perfectly still, perfectly balanced, I nearly screamed, noticing that its ribs hung out far broader than a coyote's, and its eyes were reflecting a menacing yellow. In a panic, I fired at it. It let out a heart ripping scream as it began to charge towards me. This field is about 260 feet long, so I had time to fire again. I stopped when I saw the creature drop. I sighed and slowly began to walk over to the body. 
but about halfway there, things happened so quickly. The creature stood back up. I realized I was too close and that I was going to be a goner, but then it ran off in the other direction. Perhaps I had done enough to scare it away. I stared in amazement at the creature, but soon snapped out of it and reloaded, but it was too fast. I was not able to get another hit on it. Now alone in the middle of the field, where I'd seen this inhuman thing, I was horrified. When I saw headlights coming down the road, which came from my dad's truck, I ran as fast as I could to get to him. I waved him down, then jumped into the passenger seat. Apparently, he thought that I had bagged a deer, so he had driven down to see if I needed some help. But I explained what I had seen and what I'd nearly been attacked by. As I tried to get him to believe me as we drove back to the cabin, I finished the conversation off, saying these exact words. Dad, ammunition is expensive. Why would I waste over 20 shells just for a joke or prank? He shook his head, saying that kids are dumb and they do anything for attention. Frustrated, I went to bed. That was all I ever saw of whatever the thing was. I believe it may have been a skinwalker. Next time I see it, I'll have more shells to rip through it. Vampire in Serbia from Vladimir the Lawyer, location, Serbia. This story was told to me by an old lady who was the grandmother of my best friend. In Serbia during the 1950s, in villages there were no electricity or many things that we take for granted today. If you wanted bread, you'd have to go to the old mills on the river and make flour and bring it back home so everyone could eat. Usually, it was a job for kids, especially the teenagers. One day, two brothers and a sister, who was the grandmother who was telling this story to me, went to a location where the mill was by the river so they could make and gather enough flour before heading back home. So the mill is on the little river and has one bell in front of the entrance. This will be important later. If you want to ring it, you have to grab a small metal bar and hit it. Maybe 200 meters from there, there was a small cottage where people could rest if they had to. As it was late at night, and the chore took far longer than they had planned, they bagged their flour and decided to stay in the cottage nearby during the night. Then they'd head home in the morning. Problem with that was the cottage only had two small beds, and so one of the brothers had to sleep on the floor on a pile of old clothes. They were both young, but also hard-headed, so they decided to have a little competition to see who had to sleep on the floor. They would each separately run from the cottage to the mill, then ring that bell, while the sister would count time out loud. The brother that was fastest to ring the bell would get to sleep in the bed. So the first brother, 16 years old, raced from the cottage while the sister counted out. He hit the bell with a metal bar, then ran back. The second brother, 18 years old, raced off as well. When it was his turn, it was barely light outside still, as night was almost upon them. He ran from the cottage, but it took him an odd amount of time to ring the bell. And after he did, he raced back like a lunatic. He seemed to be panicking. He pulled the sister and brother inside the cottage, panting, then locked the door, never taking his eyes off the direction of the mill through the window. The sister and younger brother were quite confused, so they asked why he was so scared. Still staring at the mill, he said that when he went inside, there was someone there, someone with red eyes that seemed to glow from the sundown light. He rang the bell as fast as he could and ran back full speed. All three of them immediately knew what he was talking about. One word came to mind. Vampire. You see, in Serbian folklore, 
vampires love to hang around mills. Mills are usually a bit away from the village, and people going there alone or with few others were very easy prey. During the night, they didn't sleep at all. Even when something started to bang and scratch at the cottage door, then it peered through the window, and all the kids saw was a glowing red pair of eyes and a tall and dark silhouette. They screamed. They decided to pray together and kneel by the beds, asking God for protection. But throughout the night, whenever they'd look out the window, they would see that awfully tall person standing near the cottage. No matter what they did, it wouldn't leave. Only when the sun came out did they exit the cottage and run back home. Needless to say, they didn't go back there and left other kids to do the mill work. Now a message from our sponsor, which greatly supports this show. I know most of you enjoy listening to these stories while you're working, driving, or even doing homework. But what do you do when you're all caught up? Well, there's never been a better time to start listening on Audible. With Audible, you get access to an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, from bestsellers to horror, mysteries, and thrillers that will satisfy your craving for fear and suspense. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet, including new Audible originals. Personally, I would recommend Stephen King's The Outsider, a haunting story that will have you on edge for the entire ride. As a member, you can choose three titles a month, one audiobook, and two Audible originals that you can't get anywhere else. You can also listen anytime, anywhere, on any device. Feel free to enjoy your favorite stories at the gym, on your way to work, or at home. Audible, the most inspiring minds, the most compelling stories, the best place to listen. You can support our show and help us keep it free and support our sponsor by getting a 30-day trial when you go to audible.com slash DPP or text DPP to 500-500 and start listening today. That's audible.com slash DPP or text DPP to 500-500 for a 30-day trial of Audible. Thanks, Audible. Now, back to the show. My Parents' Story from Heath B. Location, Jefferson County, Alabama. When I was a kid, my parents told me the story. They grew up in a small town in the northernmost part of Jefferson County in Alabama. Back in those days, around the late 60s, the town was very small and there wasn't much to do for teens like them. So one night, my parents drove down below the bridge of the Locust Fork River, where teenagers would often meet up. This night, as they arrived, no one else had gotten there yet. They decided to wait to see who would possibly show up. As they waited, my dad heard a slight whistling noise. At first, he said he didn't pay much attention to it, but as time went on, it grew louder. My dad moved the car up the hill a little bit to be under a streetlight. Then he got out to investigate because it began to sound like air leaking from one of his tires. Once out of the car, he could tell it was coming from the woods down the riverbank and it sounded like it was coming closer. He said it was much louder once getting out and he figured it was some kind of weird animal. He said that mom started getting creeped out and he didn't want to stick around to see what it was. So together they drove away. Two days later on a Sunday, a friend asked if he'd mind going with them to retrieve a boat they had left on the river from a trot lining trip on Friday. They had left the boat on the bank on one of the guy's land that butted up to the river. He said there was no road through the pasture and that it would be much easier to bring it down the river. So Dad agreed to help. They had to troll all the way up the river and bring both boats back down to where the bridge and boat launched from. While going upriver, they happened upon an abandoned campsite. 
Dad said it was very strange and looked as if someone had left in a hurry. The tent was knocked down, the fire was still smoldering, an axe was in the tree, coolers and other items were scattered about, but no one was there. Whoever had been here had left as fast as possible, not caring about leaving everything behind. The friend my dad was helping said that it must have been that old whistling thing that must have chased them off. My dad's eyes grew wide and he immediately turned towards his friend. What did you just say? He asked. The friend laughed and said, yeah, we had some kind of crazy animal spook us a bit Friday night. He said they had gotten all set up and all the lines out and they were just sitting in the boat tied to the bank waiting for the right time to run the lines. But something across the river started making a whistling sound. He said it went quiet a little while later, and they didn't pay it much attention at first. But as they got ready to run the lines, it came again, and it even started to follow the boat down the river. He said it came right down to the water's edge. One of the three guys there, who had a rifle for snakes, even fired at it but the whistling continued, only being scared further back for a moment or two before coming right back to the water's edge. He said it made all types of noise crashing through the brush. It spooked them enough to call it quits early and leave the boat tied up on the friend's land. That's when Dad shared the story he had with them about he and my mom just a few miles down the road at the bridge. It wasn't until a few days ago that someone associated the whistling sound to Bigfoot. I was watching Destination America, Terror in the Woods, season one, episode three, Hunted by Bigfoot. In the show, the men both mentioned a whistling sound, and they described it as something similar to the air being released from a tire. When I heard this, I recorded it and had my dad, who was 67, come and watch. Man, the look on his face afterwards was priceless. He said that was 47 years ago. He seemed stunned to hear someone describe a similar sound. He seemed almost relieved. My parents have always been quite honest Christians, and lying isn't something that I've ever known them to do. What it was out there, we may never truly know, but what it could have been, that's just scary. Summer Break Horror from Ron 23 Location, Philippines I live in a city here in the Philippines. One summer break, my parents decided to send me to my grandparents' place. Their house was not that big and fancy, just an ordinary house that you would see in the provinces. One day I was enjoying myself, swimming in the river. This river was too far from my grandparents' place, so me and my uncle were the only people there. Hours passed by and my uncle wanted to go back home. I was still having fun in the river, so I told him that he knew the way back. My uncle left and so I was swimming in the river alone. Once I dried myself off and changed clothes, I proceeded to head back home. After a few minutes of walking though, it was getting dark, so I opened my flashlight while walking. When I reached an area where the forest grew thicker around me, I suddenly heard a very loud laugh coming from the sky of all places. I continued walking, but after a few minutes, the laugh came again. This time, it was followed by the sound of flapping wings. I quickly looked up into a tree behind me, and there I saw a creature that is imprinted into my mind. It was almost a woman, but only her upper half, and on the back of that half were very large wings. I panicked and ran as fast as I could to head back home, but the creature didn't follow me. I heard its laughter going in another direction. Once I got to my grandparents' house, I cried, and my uncle then asked me what happened. I explained the creature I saw. 
My grandparents were shocked to hear it, and they explained to me about a creature that matched my description. It was something called the Mananango. They told me this creature always appeared at sundown or night on the prowl for pregnant women. I will never forget that experience, and I still wonder who it may have been after that night. Shadow Thing on the Riverwalk From Not a Clown Location Unknown My former best friend and I used to go on a lot of walks together back in 2017. We lived four blocks away from each other, and neither of us could drive at the time. So it was one of those things we enjoyed because it got us out of the house. It was in summer, and it was always especially nice out at night. There's a park in our town within walking distance, which was one of our usual haunts. To get there, you could either stay on the sidewalk, or you could take a shortcut on this path along the river, called the River Walk, which we would take to enter and leave the park. This instance happened one night when we were leaving the park via the shortcut around 10 p.m. The moon was pretty bright, so you could still see everything, even though there weren't many lights. As we were walking, we passed this one spot that had a small set of steps leading down to the riverbank. The conversation had lulled, and I looked directly at the steps. They were empty. I looked at my friend and made some comment on the weather being nice, or something along those lines. When I looked back at the trail, I immediately noticed the stairs in the corner of my eye, and they were no longer empty. There was a figure standing there, sitting on the top step, and they appeared to be watching us. Right away, I felt cold, like swimming through a cold spot in a warm pool. I also knew it was watching us from the way its head was facing right at us. I couldn't tell from the face because it wasn't there. Even though the moon was pretty bright, I could not see a single detail on this figure. I mean, I could see my friend's face perfectly well, and she had her back to the moon. Instead of a face on this thing, there was only a black void. I kind of seized up a bit. I could only walk past it robotically. That in and of itself is weird, because even at this time of night, at least where I live, you always acknowledge the people you walk by with a wave or a symbol high. But I could not speak next to this thing that only resembled a human and I couldn't even force out a word to my friend. I rarely get scared. Startled, sure, but almost never scared. But what I felt that night was pure instinctual terror as I walked past this man-like shape. Normally, I would have thought it was a hallucination, as I've been known to have them in the past. But a few minutes after I saw the figure, my friend said she had seen it too, and felt the exact same way as they walked by. For a long time, we had no idea what that was, but looking back on it now and after hearing stories, I believe this to be some kind of shadow entity. The Wolf from The Delinquent Location, Oklahoma I like to explore nature, whether it's through the old red dirt roads, through the woods themselves, or the river around my town. I feel safe here, most of the time. On this occasion, it was winter, and I was walking with my girlfriend and some friends of ours to one of our favorite spots about six hours from sundown. We do this from time to time. We had been walking for what seemed like two hours, and we took a break. We were all laughing and having fun, chowing down on some snacks, when I saw a shadowy shape out of the corner of my eye. Instinctively, I looked, telling myself it was probably a bird or a stray cat. We put our stuff back in our packs, put the fire out that we had going, then put our bandanas and snow goggles on. We were on our way back around, when I saw the figure again, 
Once more, I immediately turned to see what it was, ready to reach in my pack for my machete, which we had used to chop firewood. We were walking through a deep ditch with an overhanging dirt ledge, and I got everyone to be quiet as I peeked out over the ledge to see what it was. And what we saw that night will always haunt my memories. With blackish gray fur, it stood seven feet tall. Its eyes were a brownish yellow, and it had a long dog-like snout with human-like fingers, tipped with elongated black sharp nails, and it walked on two legs, like it was a person. We watched it sniffing the air above it. I whispered quietly to the group, I, I think it's looking for us. We stayed there for half an hour, hoping that it wouldn't find us. It was almost entirely dark now, the sun barely poking over the horizon. I was not about to be stuck out in the dark during winter with something that looked like that. I got everyone under the ledge to pick up the biggest rock they could find, but before we could throw it, the thing began to move closer to the snow-covered ledge. And just as we were about to rear back and throw these massive rocks, rolling the dice on either scaring it away or making it extremely mad, we heard a loud bang and the sound of something whizzing fast overhead. It sounded like a rifle. We took off running and got picked up by a friend in his truck. He rolled down the window and asked, what's wrong with you guys? Why are you holding that machete like that? I told him to just drive, and I explained along the way. We get back to town and stay at his house for the night, but I stayed up, clutching my machete, wondering if what I saw that night was anything close to normal. My friends no longer discuss that event. We prefer to forget it. Hard and Fast Rules From Nix Location, West Virginia. I have a few rules for myself, which I've developed throughout my 30 years of life. One, never go anywhere without some form of protection. Two, be ever mindful of your surroundings. And three, always know when you're in over your head. If I didn't follow these rules on the day in question, I wouldn't be alive to type this. I'm a 32-year-old guy, 6 foot 2, 220 pounds. By no means am I a small guy. I live in central West Virginia, so I was raised in the woods, hunting, fishing, camping, and hiking. When running, never look back. Ignore the pain as it comes and remember to breathe steadily and deeply. Those were the only thoughts in my head as I was running full tilt, even though I had my throwing knife in hand. I did not want to use it. The thing that came upon me while I was camping was far too big to be handled easily with a six inch blade. The only way I can describe what was pursuing me was werewolf. The creature was half a foot taller than me, walked on two legs like a man, and its maw was nothing but an amalgamation of sharp fangs and saliva. It was midday, and the thing came up from beside Williams River in Webster County. At first, I thought it was just a big dog, until I saw it walking around on two legs like it was normal. That was it for me. I hauled tail out of there, but it sensed me when I ran. And for some idiotic reason, I had the idea that climbing a tree to wait it out would be the best idea. It was one of the dumber things I have ever considered. I get about 15 feet off the ground, maybe six branches up, and the creature stops at the bottom and looks up at me. It sniffs the air, cocking its head sideways, and climbs up the tree at three times the speed as I did. Regret filled my stomach. Up wasn't an option either, so my thought was to go back down and to get to the car, which was about a mile from camp, and probably another quarter mile from my tree perch. But the question was, how would I get past the thing climbing up at me? I quickly imagined a couple of scenarios. 
I could drop down onto the ground below, on the opposite side of the tree. But if it saw me jump, it would get to me before I was able to run again. There was only one other option. A high risk, high reward kind of thing. I looked it straight in the eyes, then I fell on top of it. My boots hitting the thing's body, it caused it to fall to the ground next to me, but it took it an awkward moment to get up, allowing me to reach a full sprint, running for all I was worth to make it back to my car. I get there, only to realize that my keys were back at the campsite. Luckily, I keep a spare ignition key hidden under the dash, I started the car and drove like a madman back to Somersville. Needless to say, I don't camp out in Webster County anymore. Nor do I camp alone or without a weapon. You shouldn't do the same either. Los Chaneques Want Her From Carlos D. Location, Cordova, Veracruz, Mexico This story takes place in my native Mexico. At the time, Cordova was a rural, up-and-coming city. It was common for houses to be engulfed by vegetation. Forests from all sides could be seen adorning the city, almost framing it with its beautiful, lush nature. I loved it. My cousin, Carla, was three years old when she and her family moved into their house. The house was a beautiful colonial-style, one-story house. It had a big driveway with a nice big lawn and on its side a quaint little well, a water well, that is. The inside was divided into three sections. The first included the living room and the kitchen. The dining room and the den were in the middle section, and the last was where the bedrooms were. When I'd come to visit, I'd mostly be playing outside with my cousins, as there were woods everywhere or I'd be in my cousin's room, which is where I also slept. My aunt and uncle's bedroom, along with the guest bedroom, were at the very left corner of the house, facing the densest woods I've ever seen. At the time, I was about seven years old, and prior to what I'm about to tell you, I had never sensed any darkness in this house before. But things changed when my cousin Carla began to mention her new imaginary friend, I would find her talking to herself, sometimes in her room facing the corner, at night with the lights off. Ever since I can remember, I've always enjoyed drawing. It was pretty much my therapy next to singing. One day I was sitting in my living room, drawing, and this is where things took a turn for the seriously creepy. My cousin asked me to draw her friend Cor, a weird and very un-Mexican name to give her imaginary friend. Loving to draw, though, I complied, listening to her descriptions of her friend, starting with the shape of its head. She said that it had a cone-like head with grizzled hair that strung down from the pointed tip of its skull to its wide, beaver-like cheeks, a pear-shaped head, basically. She said that it had pointed ears that seemed to be oozing red and that his eyes were yellow with cat-like pupils. As she was describing this creature to me, I began to draw the most grotesque picture that I could come up with. I let my mind's eye see her description and fill out what she may have been looking at. I had felt as though something took over my hand and started to draw for me at the moment, as I was certainly not as skilled as the picture that was fabricated. When I was done, I was stunned by the grotesque face looking straight at me. I felt uncomfortable from that day forward, and it certainly didn't help that my little cousin stared at me when I wasn't looking, with a little smile, an ominous smile, a smile unlike her normal one, as if saying, you know what I know. I grew up as a Catholic Mexican boy, and my mother was a spiritual healer, among other things. In our culture, the paranormal is something that is taken very seriously, so I was very glad that my family sprung into action when I showed them the drawing of what Carla was befriending. Frightened, my aunt finally had some kind of evidence besides her daughter talking to the walls at three in the morning. So right away, she called over a religious authority figure 
who said she'd come and bless the house, but that wouldn't happen for another two days. Two days with these kinds of activities seemed like an eternity. Meanwhile, my uncle did some research on the house and found that it was built on top of land that was sacred to some natives back in the day, land that had never before been disturbed. However, he wasn't the first person to try to build a house there. Others had tried but never completed it. One of them had perished at the bottom of that well. To make things worse, the house was right next to a natural river that had been running there for centuries, maybe. The reason I say that made things worse is because in Mexican culture, there are entities that hang out at rivers, entities that are not out to befriend anyone, and they're there to tease, to torment, or to even take you away, especially children. Most Mexicans refer to these entities as chaneques. Chaneques are mythical Aztec creatures of Mexican folklore who are known to aggressively defend the forest and target children. The day finally came when the religious lady arrived to bless the place. She had a white dress on covered with shells, a bunch of plants that hung around her neck. They looked like trinkets designed to ward away bad spirits. Her hair was peppered with white and black streaks neatly tied into a braid. As she was blessing the house, I began to feel cold, a different kind of cold, as if I had put the back of my head in the freezer while the rest of my body was exposed to the 85 degree Mexican weather. My little cousin was angry the entire time. She would cry out loud, screaming, asking why they were taking her friend away. She screamed his name over and over, which made the religious lady take a step back, according to her. The name she screamed was the name of an evil entity known to her and her people. This is probably going to be the climax of the story. Keep in mind that in Mexico at the time, it wasn't uncommon for the lights to go out, or for the power to be shut down in the entire city for lapses of about 10 seconds. As soon as she stepped into my uncle's and aunt's bedroom, which was facing these dense woods I spoke of earlier, my cousin started acting differently. She seemed quiet and weak, as if she had just been awakened. Then all of a sudden, the lights went off. We were left with the sounds of nature in the night in the darkness, which was overbearing. My uncle quickly ran to look for some candles, we had them ready as this is a common thing in Mexico. However, as soon as he came back with them and he struck a match, the lights came back on. And to our horror, my little cousin was nowhere to be found. The screams of a panicked mother, father, cousins, and sisters running around the house could probably be heard for miles. I was frantically looking for my cousin when I immediately thought to go to the river. I screamed to my family, and we all ran as fast as we could, the religious lady in tow. When we got to the riverbank, we saw my cousin floating face down in the water. My uncle jumped in to fish her out of there, and before we knew it, he was giving her mouth to mouth, pressing on her chest, hoping to save his daughter's life. The rest of my family was crying. I held onto my aunt as tight as I could, the religious lady kept blessing her prayer in a native tongue as my uncle desperately kept trying to resuscitate his daughter. That's when Carla started coughing, throwing up water and starting to cry. She was horrified. Even though the lady claimed that the house was blessed, my family moved out. Ever since, we've never talked about this experience again. The occult is hidden for a reason. The unknown is unknown because to know it would be the end of all we think and know. Needless to say, I'm never going back to that part of Cordova, Veracruz, Mexico again. It seems to me that running water not only attracts thirsty animals, but it also brings some supernatural creatures to it drawing in things like dogmen, werewolves, and evil beings that would devour you if you didn't spot them first. So, beware the water. You don't have to be under it.
to be in danger. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this episode. And don't forget, you can share your stories with us at darknessprevails.org submit for a chance to have your story in an episode like this. I'd love to hear stories from game wardens or people in the forest service industry. If you want to support the show further, check out our sponsor at audible.com DPP or text 500-500. You can go to patreon.com slash darkness prevails or you can click the shop button below or go to teespring.com slash store slash darkness prevails to browse our merchandise. Thank you. Now, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous full episode about scary prison stories. Thorn says, all the horror channels are uploading. Nice. Horror narration is one of the cooler parts of the YouTube community because when we all upload at once with these super long videos, you end up going from not having anything to watch to several hours of scary content in an instant. Hope you enjoyed. Alex Bernal says, I'm glad you reposted this video. Almost had me worried there for a minute. Yeah, YouTube's default upload status is public and I forgot to change it that time. And you don't want to publish a video until you wait to see if it's demonetized. You got all your metadata, put the video in the right playlists, get all your cards on there and your end screen thumbnails. Uploading can be quite the chore. Lauren Carroll Music says, I was stuck in traffic because of snow for five hours and already got to listen to this one. Thanks for helping me keep my sanity. You know what? I bet that was stressful, but I guarantee you, you made a memory out of it. For example, moving up into this new town, I had to drive hours on end, getting back and forth from the old place to the new moving stuff. But now that we're all settled, I really want to go drive again, listening to some scary stories as the woods fly by. Mo says, prison, eh? Gonna join Darkness and his Nightwatcher gang to survive. Yeah, we don't attack people we don't like. We just tell them some stories and give them nightmares. Justin O'Rourke says, there's a certain calming elegance to your voice. Thanks for getting me through my shifts at work. You're welcome, Justin. I'm a fan of many other podcasts and YouTube channels for that very same reason. These stories really help to pass the time. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Darkness Prevails. But don't you worry, because more scary stories are coming soon. So stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons. Remember to stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.